You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis strategy overviews listener questions and much more if it involves puts and calls then our all-star panel will break it down it's time to hit the option block with your host mark longo from the options insider media group and co-hosts uncle mike tussaw from rcm asset management andrew the rock lobster joe Venazzi from optionfit.com and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at Fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, get ready to hit the option block. Welcome back to the Option Block, everyone's favorite. I hope it's your favorite. It's certainly my favorite bi-weekly source for all things options related. A little bit of wit, a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of unusual activity, some analysis, some education, some strategy. Your questions appear into the future. Mix it all together. And you got the tasty stew. That is the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from the brand spanking new TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting network. If you don't use our app, if you want to check it out, it's got all good sorts of good stuff. If you're saying, tell me about the breadth, what is the breadth of this network he's talking about? Well, the app has it all. Every show we've ever done for the last dozen or so years, that's a lot. So download it and then have at it. You will certainly, I can guarantee you this, you will not be bored. You will not be wanting for options content. We got you covered. And of course, however you listen live after the fact, speaking of live, not sure. I don't think there's a live going out there right now off the check, but I think Mixler is still down. Mixler having all sorts of problems this week. I guess they got knocked off their main uh, their main database and they're on some backup servers. So I don't think there's a live stream out there right now, but thankfully the on-demand version will be available as usual to you guys. Uh, unfortunately for these guys, listen, listen live, you won't be able to tune in and ask questions today, but you'll be able to get it on all your regular platforms. After the fact, and joining me on the program today, let's see who we got. Let's start off. Let's go out to the land of St. Charles, where I don't think it's raining like it is right here, where we are joined by the appropriately enough Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. Is it indeed torrentially raining like it is down here seemingly every day? No, we actually have, uh, it, it's it's nice and overcast up here today. So that's what we have here in the Chicagoland area, overcast and uh, mid-60s. Mid sixties, a little cool, but not uh, not terrible. Uh, I guess I'll trade I'll trade some of that coolness for a little bit of less rain. That would certainly be nice <laughs> down here. Again, I am coming at you from the southern studio here today, listeners. So if I sound a little bit different, that's why I'm not beaming in from the HQ there in Chicago. And joining us from off in parts unknown, let's see where he's beaming in from. We are joined, holding down the Fidelity hot seat today, Colin Songer from the old Fidelity Active Trader Strategy Desk. Colin, welcome back to the program. Refresh my memory. Are you part of the Jacksonville crew? Are you up north? Where are you beaming in from? Um, I'm up north in New Hampshire. Ah, so I'm guessing it might even be lower than 65 up there. <laughs> and, uh, it's ringing in around uh, about the same, about the 60s, but it is definitely raining. So uh, we do what we can. We do what we can indeed as we keep on rolling with the show right on into the trading block. 
It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block. This is indeed the portion of the show where, surprise, surprise, we talk about what the heck is trading out there. And we got ourselves an interesting one here kicking off the show, listeners, with, you know, we've been doing this dance for a while. The will they, won't they dance with uh, with the trade war, with global tensions in Iran, with a bunch of other things. Apparently, we're in a uplifting type of mood out there, but maybe not so totally. We'll get to that in a bit. Most of the major indices up and up pretty strong today, up about half a percent or so, pretty much across the board. The Nasdaq actually a bit of a laggard today. Usually, is leading the charge. Today, it's a laggard, only up a mere four-tenths of a percent. How dare it? Uh, of course, uh, gold getting a bit of a lift and crude oil getting a lift. We'll get to crude oil in a bit later today, listeners, on the old Twifo show. But uh, WTI hovering in that 56 range, uh, bouncing about nearly three handles off uh, the tweets from, from Trump saying Iran made a big mistake shooting down one of our drones. So crude getting a bit of a lift out there as well. And of course, all this kind of what's going on out there in the space, even though it is a lot of green on the screen. We also have some green in the vol space, which is a bit of an unusual day. Not usually we have a day where the markets are firmly in rally ho mode and we're heading into a weekend and yet we still see uh, the the firmness out there in the VIX cash. And that's pretty much exactly what we're seeing out there. VIX cash 1530 up about a handle. As you recall, listeners, last week on Vol Views, I was saying I, I felt a little bit of an ebbing and flowing, but not a ton. And I thought we'd be back close to where we were. I think there's still something keeping us uh, a foot out there in the market, certainly pricing in on the VIX futures curve there with um, with uh, everything being extremely flat uh, out there. So they're pricing a lot of uncertainty. And that's kind of the way I was feeling for the Vol Views. And well, so far, at least, that prediction. Looking pretty good. VVIX, or I should say VIX, at about a 15.30. VVIX itself at about an 86 coming into show to 86.20. So actually, it, it was uh, kind of unched. It was at about an 83. Now coming into showtime, it's about an 86 or so. So it has moved a bit. VIX itself also having moved. It was about 14.30, about an hour before showtime, which brings it down about a point from last show. And now, as of the start of the show... It's pretty much unched from our last show. Actually, it is exactly unched, 15.30. So a lot of interesting things cooking out there. Let's go back the opposite way. Let's start in Fidelity land. Uh, Mr. Colin, what, uh, what is lighting up your tape over there in the land of Fidelity, sir? So interesting enough, uh, apparently the uh, IPO world is still popping with uh, Slack Technologies, uh, which is symbol, symbol W-O-R-K, uh, being one of the top traded by Fidelity customers. Uh, it opened up today, you know, being priced at 26, and now it's trading about 41, uh, so up about 15 points, uh, interesting enough, off of off of its pricing. Next coming in is a, a kind of usual su suspect with Amazon. Um, you know, a lot of news or headlines coming out with that. Uh, you know, the Wal Walmart corner shop deal f uh, f um, falls, as well as uh, – the idea that they struck a deal with uh, GE and Boeing uh, early on Tuesday at the Paris Air Show. Uh, so all that kind of coming together. Amazon is right now trading at uh, 1911 spot 68, so up about almost uh, three dollars, just under three dollars, uh, about a tenth of a percent. And uh, interesting enough, it is above all its uh, major moving averages. Uh, so far today, uh, but it sold off. It opened up higher and has sold off so far today. Uh, now, interesting enough, when we look at the cut to, uh, call to put ratio, it's trading about one and a half calls to about one put, uh, where the 90-day average is actually closer to one and a quarter call traded for every one put. Uh, symbol K E R N. Uh, they're actually ringing the Nasdaq closing bell today. Uh, so, interesting enough, Akerna Corporation uh, is opened up at 65 today, uh, but right now it's currently trading at 40 spot 64, which is down about $9.16. Uh, interesting enough, I thought this um, was a, a fun fact here. Now, it did create a new year high print for today, uh, but it... Uh, Interesting storyline with this is that it closed at 10 spot 19 just one week ago. Uh, so interesting development there. Um, but 
no options available on that. Just thought it was an interesting story. That's what the Fidelity customers are trading. Uh, another usual suspect is Tesla. Uh, like always, uh, you know, it seems that every now and then they pop in there. Uh, Goldman slash a price target to $158 from $200. Tesla right now trading below its 50-day simple moving average and 200-day simple moving average, uh, but has rallied recently to get above its 200-day moving average. Uh, interesting enough with the uh, volume for calls and puts, call to put ratio is for every one call being traded, uh, there's one spot, one four uh, puts being traded which is basically in line with its 90-day average, which is sitting at one call to one spot, one seven put traded. And lastly, uh, Beyond Meats. Uh, for right now, a headline reading, uh, Del Taco introduced a new bur uh, burrito uh, with Beyond Meats uh, plant-based protein. It did print a new high uh, just recently, a couple of days ago. And the call to put ratio is one call to every one spot zero two, so puts just barely edging out calls, while the 90-day average is one and a quarter call traded to every one put. So though that's what uh, the Fidelity customers are trading uh, as of today. I gotta say, speaking of Beyond, I I've raved about the Beyond Burger. I finally had an Impossible Burger yesterday. Have you guys had one of those? I still can't get myself to do it. <laughs> you can't, uh, you just, gotta try I'm it. Still sell like my regular burger. You got you gotta pull the trigger, right? It's for people like us. It's for people who are loath to give up their their traditional, you know, carnivore diet. And so they this is a good way to lure you to the dark side. And uh, we got one yesterday <laughs> at, a, at a restaurant. You can only you can only really get impossible at restaurants still. You can't really buy them in stores. And uh, it was it was amazing. I mean, if you had told me, you know, hey, this is not a regular grilled burger, I probably would have been hard pressed not to believe you. Maybe the restaurant just did it very well. But either way, it was, it was one of those ones where I took a bite of it. And I said, whoa, this is this is something I can get behind. So I could see why uh, that, that was, of course, impossible, not beyond. But I could see why the furor and the frenzy, at least product wise, is merited. There's still questions, of course. Can they deliver? Can they turn a profit? Can they source enough materials to meet demand? All these questions are certainly valid. But the core product, at least, of the two that I've sampled, the Beyond and the Impossible, are, are fairly impressive. They have done a good job. If I am their target audience of the, the reluctant carnivore and uh, in terms of reluctant to leave being a carnivore. And they are, they are arming me with ammunition to, to lure me to the diet. I could certainly see a, a more vegetarian-centric diet being more feasible to me now that those, those products exist, <laughs> uh, which is kind of interesting. You mentioned, of course, our old friend Tesla out there as well. Tesla lighting it up again today to the downside. This is the one that's kind of given and taken and given and taken. Today they're taking off about six handles, nearly 3%, right around 220. This is the name, of course, we talked about. It's just kind of been all over the board. Got a low of shy of 180 just a, just a few weeks ago out of the early June. And then now it's re rebounded all the way up to around uh, two, got up to two, about 225 or so. Looks like it was the high recently. And now down to 220 again. So off the near term highs, but still 40 handles above where it was trading just a few weeks ago. So. Don't feel too bad for all the all those Tesla bulls out there. Speaking of Tesla, let's see what is lighting it up out there in the options land again. No surprise, listeners. It's still dominating the top ten here of open interest. Number one with the bullet. Still the June fifty puts seventy nine thousand nine hundred and four of those bad boys there. Number two are the Jan fifty puts sixty three thousand of those bad boys. So a little bit longer time for that fifty to come to pass. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say those June fifties probably not gonna work out. But hey. They've got a whole day left, so you never know. Can you imagine the scenario where Tesla goes from 220 to 50 in the course of a day? Uh, not, probably not a good one for uh, for Tesla devotees out there. Number three, the jet, uh, the jam par puts uh, 45,000 of those. Number four, the July 250 calls, 42,000 of those bad boys. Pretty bullish for for those. Of course, not, not that bullish given where we are right now. It's, it's seen more bullish when we were at 180 than it does now here at 220. And round out the top five here, at least, the Jan 10 puts, about 40,000, 39,000 or so of those. So a lot lighting it up there. Mr. Uncle Mike, first off, have you sampled the delicious Beyond or Impossible Burger? And secondly, aside from those delicious faux meats, what is lighting up your tape, sir? I have not sampled such a burger, and um, I'm just going to leave my thoughts on that as um, – I, I am pretty close minded on that because you're messing with something that really shouldn't be messed with, in my opinion. Um, this is from um, someone who's I, I've probably eaten 10 million cheeseburgers in my life. And uh, he, they, 
I'm speechless, so I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> the cheeseburger um, is, is a sacred thing for you, huh? You don't want anyone messing with it? Yeah, it, it's – I have a hard time with that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll eat a turkey burger, but the um, – to have something meatless, um, have to admit I'm having a hard time with that one. But I will say – to them, if that's something that makes the world a better place and they make money on it. God bless. I will say those the tur- the Beyond and Impossible Burgers taste more like a burger than a turkey burger does. I'll give I'll give them that. You haven't had my turkey burger. Okay, that's true. I got to come to the Tucson house for your for your turkey burger. But I, I'm I'm pulling you off the rails, sir. What what is lighting up your take? For sure, for sure. Well, never before in the history of the entire stock market has there ever been a better time to sell than this morning. And uh, so we did hit new all time highs today in the S and P. So that's always an exciting thing. Um, gold and silver do have a little bit of a boost in them. Silver's up over 2% on the day, or at least SLV is. Uh, I think a lot of this is with uh, some fear over us possibly doing something in the Iran world. Uh, so that's one thing that's going on. Um, this is kind of a concerning, weird type of a day, the way with which I see it. And what I mean by that is, is that we're at new all-time highs in the S&P, while we're about a point below it right now. And uh, the VIX is higher by uh, um, 85 cents. And so with that, it's kind of one of those things that makes your head scratch. Now, if that doesn't make your head, make you scratch your head, uh, the fact that we are ahead a little bit in the bond world, bonds are up, commodities are up, uh, markets are up. But whenever we have everything up like that, um, it kind of makes me a little bit concerned. So with my aggressive strategies, uh, at least for right now, um, I'm kind of what, uh, at least for the time being, I'll probably change this by the end of the day today, but, um, it's, it, it's a Randy Moss market for me. Now, for those of you who remember Randy Moss, he was the wide receiver that, uh, the controversial wide receiver that played for a bunch of teams, primarily the Minnesota Vikings. And, uh, the reason I say it's a Randy Moss market is because people ask me, uh, what positions am I in today? And I'm going to quote Randy Moss at one point, Randy Moss was fined. And they said, well, how are you going to pay this fine? And his reply, his reply was straight cash, homie. And so what I'm in right now for my aggressive strategy for the time being, straight cash, homie. And we'll see what happens towards the end of the day today. I'll probably get in some, some more Delta exposure. But uh, this morning's kind of uh, the fact that we have new all-time highs, <coughs> VIX being higher, and me coming off of a good um, run on the current call with which I'm in, it kind of makes you want to take a look at things. Uh, last fall, for example, uh, I actually had a, a spot to where I was very bullish on the market. Obviously, I was dead wrong, but I really believe that risk management needs to triumph over uh, market sentiment. So that's kind of what I'm seeing right now, and uh, we'll see where things go. So just to reiterate, Uncle Mike, the permable, you are all in cash right now. Wow, that's that's saying a lot, sir. It doesn't happen very often, but and it probably won't last very long, but at least for right now. And, not, and this is just my aggressive strategy. I'm not talking about like the stock holdings, the triple income or things like that. I'm talking about my aggressive strategy. That's all in cash. Okay, I was going to say, cause I, I, can't, I have a hard time picturing you completely in cash. So you still have the exposure just, just in, the, in, the aggressive, in the aggressive portion of the Uncle Mike portfolio. That's where we're not seeing that. What we are seeing, let's, see, let's actually let's see what we are seeing out here in the broad market out here today what's lighting up the market let's hit the indices first actually a fairly active day all things considered i mean we're moving but we're not moving a ton and yet we're seeing decent paper out there uh let's start off uh vix coming into showtime was at about three hundred and ten thousand contracts the adv has come off quite a bit if you've been paying attention to our vol views and other shows listeners it was north of 600 almost 700,000 now down to about 451,000 310 on the tape as of today so a pretty robust day spy lighten up the tape something big going up out there off the check two and a half million contracts on the tape as of showtime the adv 2.8 looks like it's going to blow the doors off its adv today spx doing similar numbers 1.1 million on the tape as of showtime at versus 1.3 million the ADV. So SPX and SPY, both the big indices, even though they're up a half a percent, I mean, that's a decent move, but uh, something, they're, they're trading up a storm out there. We've seen bigger moves out there with a lot less volume out there. So something is triggering some paper. The Q, 638,000 on the tape coming at showtime, 775,000. And Russell, 
IWM, uh, 364000 on the tape, two ninety nine the average. So blowing the doors off, of course, Russell Recon is coming up soon. So that, of course, driving some activity in that neck of the woods. In terms of the individual equities, let's go off. The top, let's do top 20 today. Let's expand it a little bit. Let's expand our reach and our horizons here. Number 20, Twitter, 69,000. Number 19, Disney, 73,000. Number 18, our old friend JD, 50, 57,000. Actually, no, I'm sorry, 76,000. That's better. Uh, number 17, Beyond, the aforementioned Beyond Meat, 82,000 on the tape. Number 16, Snap, 85,000. Number 15, NVIDIA, 91,000. Number 14, Neo. Going back to China, 107,000. Number 13, Netflix, buck 25 on the tape. Number 12, Micron, 128,000. Number 11, Oracle, 143,000. Now we get into the top 10. Number 10, Amazon, 147,000. Number 9, Baba, back out to China, 148,000. The bottom half of the top 10, really tight. Number 8, Microsoft, 149,000. So 1,000 contracts separates each of those bottom three. Uh, then we go up to uh, Bank of America, 177,000, tied with Facebook for number six there, six and seven, 177,000 each of those. Number five, AVGO, a.k.a. Broadcom, 178,000 on the tape. Number four, AMD, 202. Number three, the aforementioned Tesla, 236,000 contracts. Number dos there, Apple, 259. Number one, once again, GE, 322,000. Th- Apple getting bumped out of the top spot for the second show in a row, interesting enough, worth noting also Oracle is post-earnings on that. In terms of the most biased paper here we're seeing in the top 20, let's see. 75% of it on the call side for Neo. I don't know if anyone can threaten that. Now, that seems to be the largest bias in any one direction, listeners. Call side, 75%. Actually, not take it back. Snap. 84% of that paper in Snapland. 84% of that 85,000 contracts coming on the call side of the ledger. Just another reminder, listeners, coming up on XDiv for SPY on the 21st. So for all you out there writing cover calls out there, you don't send us emails. Why did, what happened? To my, why do I have this position in my account now? What happened? Remember, there is a dividend in SPY, and it's coming up. So be attentive to that. Think, speaking of things coming up, we had Oracle early in the week. That's why Oracle was lighting it up. Uh, they were on Wednesday. Barnes & Noble was on Wednesday as well for terms of earnings. Tuesday was Adobe. Uh, today, too bad we have the meatball here. Darden Restaurants, restaurants uh, popping off here after the bell. Kroger as well. And tomorrow, CarMax for all of you out there looking at some call low. Speaking of call low, let's see really quickly. Uber is one you guys are trading quite a bit out here of late. Let's just see what the top position is in Uber. Let's roll on here. Number one position in Uber. Uber coming into showtime. Let's see. Let's see where they are right now. You guys have actually been trading a fair amount of Uber post IPOs. One of the ones that has some some resilience. Off about a buck twenty, forty three sixty six right now. Off about nearly three percent, about two and three quarters percent. So forty three sixty six for Uber, and we're at right now. Let's see the Jan twenty twenty one. 25 puts with about 22,000 open there. That's the number one spot out there. Looks like some long-term corporate uh, corporate, uh, corporate shareholder paper dominating the number one spot. Number two is the Jan 2020, so a lot closer to home. 35 calls, other side of the tape there as well. So a little bit of upside, actually in the money calls now. And then number three, the Jan, excuse me, D's 40 puts with about 9,000, almost 10,000. Number four, the Jan 45 calls. 8,600 of those, number five, the jam, just me, July 45 calls, number four, number five, the Jan, 40 puts here, it's about 8,000 of those. All right, that's it for the trading block. Let's keep on rolling. Let's get weird. Let's get wild. Let's get on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Odd Block. This is indeed the portion of the show where we get a little, a little weird, a little wild, a little whimsical. Mr. Mr. Uncle Mike, the Option Pit Boys are on assignment today. So do you feel up for jumping into the fray today, sir? Always excited to join the fray of the odd block. I'll Uh I'll give my best Sebastian impression. All right. So that means you have to make some off-color jokes, reference the 80s a lot. You have to make your voice a lot more tinny. So work on that 
uh, while we're going. I'll try to make I'm some. I'm going to go over to the grocery store and do some grocery shopping <laughs> yes. too while we're doing yes. it. Yes, do that. Walk your dog, bring your kid in, all sorts of fun stuff. That'll be the the true Sebastian analog. I'll try to pick some names that you're really familiar with as well, Uncle Mike, that you know very deeply and very well. Like our first one, one of the ones you always talk about on our show. Uh, this is Ikvia Holdings. Of course you knew I was going to go there, Uncle Mike. You know, I, you know how much I know that you know that you love Ikvia Holdings. Ticker symbol IQV. In case you're wondering, this is formerly Quintiles and IMS Health Inc. Uh, it's an American health, conglo- health IT con- and clinical research conglomerate. So there you go. Trading today, 154 even, off about 30-odd cents. This ticker symbol, like I mentioned, IQV. This is the name over the past year. It's been on an interesting run. A year ago, they are trading 105, so well shy of where they are right now. They kind of dipped down a little bit below the, the par handle at about 98 or 99. That was in June of last year. That seems to have pretty much been the low, right around 98. And then they kind of bounced up to about 130 in September and then sold off again when everyone else did back to guess when on Christmas Eve, down to about 105. And they bounced up again. And they were trading by Christmas, by February, by Valentine's Day, actually. They were trading 141 again, so they had a nice run. They had roughly about a 35-handle run or so up to February, and they kind of been bouncing around there. And they sold off again, down to 135 again, and were living around there for a while until the last week or so when they shot up from pretty much 135 all the way up to where they are right now, 154. So it's been a good little run here for IQV, up 50% on the year and up quite a bit just in the last week or two. So let's see what our Eye of Sauron found for us, listeners. Yep, it's calls. I had a feeling it might be calls. It was the July 160s. So remember I said IQV coming is at 154, so we're a little bit out of the money here. July 160s going up for 130. These calls, (laughs) get this for a market. They were 130 at 330. That's gross. That that I'm, I'm offended. I don't, even, I don't even trade this product, and I'm offended by that quote. <laughs> People say to me, why, why do you spend so much time talking about liquidity providers and what we can do to restore them? Uh, because that stuff like that is reflective of the fact that we don't have a lot of liquidity providers really in this space anymore. And they're certainly not stepping up to provide tight markets and names like IQV, which, let's be charitable, is well into the bottom half. Of the of the fifty percentile there, <laughs> and yeah, so a two dollar market, <laughs> and this guy came in and he hit the bid. So there's no there's no there's nothing coy about what this guy's up to. He had to hit the bid. There's no real market here. He hit the bid five thousand and eighty two times for a, what was it a buck thirty opening over there on the Philly. Uh, let's see, earnings are going to be on July twenty fourth. So there there is no earnings. In this right, right before earnings, which is kind of interesting. So, Mister Mister Uncle Mike, this looks like it has all the feels of a traditional type covered call here, looking to get a buck thirty. The na- this is you're talking about five, six handles out of the money. So, if the stock rallies a bit, he's selling it for one sixty one and change. Not a bad level, given the levels we've seen over the past year. Out there. Actually, I think that would be a high uh, for what we've seen over the past year. So. If he gets called away, he's dumping it at a new 52-week high. If he doesn't, he pockets a buck thirty. Not the worst thing in the world. I'm more offended by this market than I am by the by the trade. What about you, Uncle Mike? <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I don't see what else it could be unless there's any other paper, which if there was, you would have mentioned it um, for that many times. I mean, it's. I have a hard time believing that someone would sell a naked call in something like this right before earnings. It doesn't sound like it's part of any type of spread. So I would say it's for sure a covered call with just someone that's looking at this thinking uh, people are having a meeting in their investment room, may or may not be an experienced option person, but they're thinking, you know what, our target on this is 160. If it goes to earnings and uh, goes above 160, that's where we'd sell it at anyway. Hey guys, why not get paid to actually sell the stock? So that's kind of what my feel of this is and uh, because Typically, an option person probably wouldn't be doing a lot with uh, markets two dollars wide. Yeah, no, you'd see that and run the other way. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of feel for this guy. Maybe that was a little bit better market. He could have got even better price on these things. He decided not to mess with it, hit that bid, and uh, get the heck out of Dodge. All right, Uncle Mike. I know I promised you some names you're going to know. Obviously, IQV, one of the big ones you like to trade. Here's another one. I, I know you are. You probably have already guessed the ticker before I even say it. But we're talking Uncle Mike popular names. We're talking Pure Storage, Inc. We're talking PSTG. Am I right, sir? This is the name you just love, right? You wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you have your coffee maybe, you do your little morning morning routine, and then you're checking PSTG. Is that correct? 
I do that all that that's that is the morning routine before I do all that stuff. That's what I look at. I mean, I, I have the chart streaming on my wall in my bedroom on a big <laughs> flat screen. Streaming. Nothing, nothing for PSTG 24 <laughs> 7. If you're wondering, it's a storage company, but maybe not the way you think. It's not like you know a, a U-Haul, you go rent storage. I'm kind of curious to hear what they are. Yeah, they're an all flash data storage hardware pr- pr- manufacturer. So they make jump drives effectively. <laughs> and memory and things like that sounds like uh so yeah there you go not what i expected with that name but there you go they're a jump drive manufacturer uh trading today sixteen dollars and 58 cents up about a third of a buck or about two and a quarter percent been an interesting year for this one too a year ago they were trading 24 and change so about 50 percent north of where they are right now so it looks like it hasn't been a great year for pstg they got as high over that course of that year as Right around 29 bucks. that was back in September of last year. So they peaked substantially higher, almost double where they are right now. And then they kind of began the uh, the long slide. A lot of names hit into Q4 of last year, and they kind of sold off hard again in October. So from September, they were trading almost 30. September 11th, by a month later or so, a little bit more than a month later, they were trading uh, 18 and change. So they got clipped pretty good over that period. And then they sold off again right around Christmas Eve, hit their nadir right around four, about 14 bucks, 13.99 is a 52 week low. So they hit right around that level. And they were kind of at it close to it again recently. They were trading, must have had earnings recently because they were trading almost 21 on May 21st. And the next day they're trading about 15 bucks. So they got clipped yet again. So this one almost looks like a chart of like a biotech where it's up and it's down and it's up and it's down and everything's very dramatic. Now, there's no subtle moves here in this chart, uh, which is, if I just looked at this chart, I said, this might be a biotech. Or, but nope, it's a flash memory storage company, which is interesting. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron returned for us today out here, listeners. All this action back and forth, hither and yon. We got some calls lighting up the tape today. Looks like some decent clips of calls, too. Not just one, but multiples. It was the July 17 half. So remember I said, listeners, we were at 16 half, roughly, after today's action. So these are about a buck out of the money, going up 2,635 times in the first block for 35 cents. These were 25 at 35, so a much tighter market than our, our former market there in IQV. Someone lifting the offer 2,000, excuse me, 635 times on the Philly. This is opening, but they weren't done there. Now they came back in 20, cent, 20 seconds later, I should say, to buy another 2,000, 2,065 to be precise, actually. So a total of not quite 5,000, pretty close to it here, of these July 17 halves. Second block also going up for 35 cents. So they got, they were 25 at 35. They picked up about 2,600. Then they moved it 25 to 40, and they came back in and bought another 2,000 in change, also at 35 cents. So someone deciding to step up and honor that former offer for them, it sounds like. And that was on the MyAx this time. So they're jumping from exchange to exchange to get as much flow as they can here on this track. So it looks like someone really wants to get himself long, Uncle Mike, these July 17 half. So he's paying 35 cents. So he's getting pretty close to 18 for those calls to start making making some moolah for him. And the clock's ticking on these. These are July as well. So he's got about a month in the chamber for these bad boys to pay off. Let's look at that chart again. So a year ago, there was trading close to double where it is right now. So there is maybe an argument to be made looking at this chart that there is some upside room to run. Uncle Mike, how you like this? Taking a flyer. It's a, it's a cheap stock to begin with. It's $16. Taking a flyer on $0.35, cents, roughly 5,000 times uh, to to see this thing start to light it up to the upside. You like this one or not so much? I mean, if, if, you, if you view it as a flyer, I actually like it. If you view it as something to where you want to try to consistently make money on buying out of the money calls, then I don't like it. I think that uh, options are a very powerful product, and this shows another way with which they can be used in a very powerful way in that if this stock does go up to 21 or something along those lines, whoever bought those calls is going to be dancing like Carlton from uh, um, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But if not, if if it's a lot of money, and a lot of a bigger portion of their portfolio, then he's going to be crying. But uh, if it's a small amount of money, then uh, it's going to be one to, one of those for that person or the group or whoever invested it. If it's a reasonable amount of money that they put in, then I like doing stuff like that. Uh, so long as you manage risk in the best way you can. Yeah, obviously have some clear rules when to take this off if it's going against you. Obviously, this thing's going to start eroding. So you really only have a couple of weeks before that erosion really kicks in pretty good and you might have to start triggering that closeout rule so that that's another thing to keep in mind when you're doing these 
these types of long premium near term trades. The clock is ticking, and you don't get all of that full month before you really start seeing that uh, that decay tick in. You got a, you got a couple of weeks, and you're gonna have felt it. So you need to move, and you need to move pretty quickly. But as long as you're down with that, Uncle Mike is down with you. And it sounds like Uncle Mike. I think you meant the Carlton dance from Fortnite, because infamously they stole it, and then he he sued them, but he lost. <laughs> so that is now really? the, the Carlton. The, yes, they had characters doing it in Fortnite, and he tried to sue, saying it was his protected dance, and the courts uh, saying not so much. So yeah, so you can do the Carlton dance now in Fortnite if you are so inclined. And maybe you're also inclined. How crazy is that that the CBOE can protect the SPX, but Carlton can't protect <laughs> nope. his dance? Nope, he can't protect his dance. It is unprotectable, or I forgot what the exact ruling. Maybe it was because it was the it was the show's property, not his, because he did it on a show, and so therefore maybe they gave permission. I don't know what it was, but whatever the ruling was, it was it came down against him. And so no. No Carlton money for the Carlton dance there in Fortnite. Maybe looks like some money here for our last name here in the album. Uncle Mike, you know, I was kind of teasing you with those first two, saying those are names that you liked. Clearly, they're not Uncle Mike names. But our third one, I mean, it couldn't be more up your alley unless it was called Uncle Mike's Football House of Love and Cheeseburgers, right? I mean, that that would pretty much, that would be up your alley a lot. But second only to that is this. Of course, I'm talking and about, that. of course, I'm talking about C Limited. Ticker symbol SE. You, you knew where I was going with this one, right, Uncle Mike? This is like your this is your bread and butter right here. I mean, it, it, almost as much as the data storage, but I am surprised <laughs> you didn't find anything on the Dollar General or Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and have uh, you talked about this one before on the show, listeners? Uh, and C Limited is actually also Garena, a game developer. So they have about five different names. This company, which is always a sign of something, is very very quality and above board. And they have five different names. Uh, they're headquartered in Singapore. Exactly. Yes, you're headquartered in Singapore, if you're wondering. Uh, and their first self-developed title, Free Fire, is a mobile battle royale game. So there you go. I taught you something today. Let's see what else we learned. We talked about these on the show a few months, actually almost exactly two months ago, listeners. April 22nd, we talked about someone coming in and blowing the doors off some downside puts in SE. At the time there, let's see where they were trading on April 22nd. They were SE was trading at 2368. Coming into today's show... They're up quite a bit. Up, they're thirty-one and a half, so up, you know, roughly looks like about seven bucks and change, or close to it, uh, there since the April show. So it's been a good run. What did we see back in April? We saw someone really aggressively blowing the doors off these May twenty puts, uh, selling them almost sixteen thousand times, fifteen thousand nine hundred twenty-six times for twenty-one cents, and then some splits after their end. Let's just call it twenty-one cents. That was pretty much below the bid, actually, on uh, over there on Amex. So they were twenty-five cent bid at forty. He blew them through to get sixteen thousand done. He had to, he had to be a little aggressive. So he got it all done around twenty-one cents. Worth noting, they had earnings on the fourteenth. So this had it was was an earnings trade, and it looks like this one went their way. Because like I mentioned, the stock is substantially north of that. It's at thirty-one right now. And let's look really quickly to see if we ever really threatened the the twenty handle any time in that. In that run, it was April 22nd, and then pretty much, no, it never really looked back. The lowest it got was in the mid-24s, and then it gapped up after the earnings, looks like, to about, up to about 20, actually 30, broke 30. And then now it's, and then it sold off again, now it's back over 30 again. So, yeah, this thing has never really threatened the 20 handles, so surprise, surprise, these puts were still open back on May expiration. And it looks like that was the biggest trade total uh, of this contract's life. Looking at our the data, courtesy of our friend, the Flowmaster, Mr. Trade Alert over there. Check it out for yourself, tradealert.com. Listeners, you can see the life-to-date flow history of this name. And the biggest day by far was 16000 and change for the April 22nd. They did about 2000 on the 18th of April as well, a couple days before. Uh, that brought the total OI to around 20000 which is pretty much exactly where it was. On April, on May expiration, nothing really changed. And these things never really traded for size pretty much ever again. In fact, the total lifetime contracts traded were about 22000 So a good chunk of that traded on just that April 22nd. And, yeah, worth noting, yeah, open interest over 20000 on this track. So it's like someone pretty much pocketed about $330,000 on this trade. Mr. Uncle Mike, so they probably had – maybe they had some stock, in which case – they were uh, happy on that, or we could view it as as they pocketed three thirty, but they missed the stock and they didn't have it as well. So in which case they may be lost out. How do you view this? You're a glass half full, a glass half empty guy, Uncle Mike. 
I think they're going, I think they missed it. Um, just my gut feeling, but I kind of think that they missed it for this one. Um, typically on the odd block, it's you're not in the odd block for good things. So I'm a, I'm a pessimist on this one, just because we have a very long record on the odd block of uh, typically bad things happening. Good things do happen at times, but it's usually not good. <laughs> Uncle Mike, what happened? What happened to the diehard optimist? You're you're the perma bull, but you're in cash, and you're usually my go-to optimist. And here you're being my my go-to pessimist. What what have you done, with Uncle Mike, sir? Well, there's puts involved. I mean, put options. I mean, who, what kind of an optimist even deals in such things? <laughs> nothing. I mean, come on. Nothing good happens when there are puts involved. Yeah. I think I think you and Thomas Pettifee may agree on something <laughs> there with that one. All right. Speaking of agreeing, let's see if we agree with you. It's time to keep on rolling right on into the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail block. You guys know the drill. You ask us questions. Sometimes we ask you guys questions like we did this week. This week's question of the week looks like a fun one. You guys are chiming in left, right, and central on this one. We said, hey, beginning of the week, let's play a bit of a guessing game. Which of the following names has the highest 30-day realized? Now, realized volatility. Not implied, not anything else. Realized slash historical volatility. Don't cheat. Don't look up it on you. Anyone can look it up on their brokerage platform and do the math. We want you to know, what is, what is your gut telling you? What do you think has the highest volatility? We gave you four choices. Our, our old friend Tesla, our another old friend Bitcoin. By the way, no no crypto rundown this week. Obviously, you guys noticed we are traveling a bit here, so it's kind of hard to do all the shows there. But that one will be back in the hopper soon. Don't worry if you missed that one. A lot going on in, in Bitcoin land. Over nine thousand again. A lot of things happen in there. So we'll be we'll be running down some crypto again pretty soon. But maybe touch on a little bit coming up on Twifo a little bit later today. Stay tuned for that. Uh, crude oil, another one moving a lot, or the Nasdaq, aka the Qs. So I gave you four interesting choices. Uh, let's go to Colin. Colin, you haven't had a chance to weigh in on this one yet. Four choices, the Qs, WTI, Bitcoin, or Tesla. Which do you think has the highest 30-day, 30 30-day 30 realized volatility, sir? Oof. Uh, and I, I can't look either, so that makes it a little tough. Um uh, I'll tell you this, you know, what I've seen, although the cues have been pretty volatile, um, I, I really can't go with them. It's a little bit more broad based. Um, Bitcoin does seem to be pretty volatile. Uh, Tesla does seem to be all over the place, um, you know, pretty hard sell off. So that's going to expand that range pretty well, especially the last 30 days. Crude oil has quite the run. I don't know. I, I think I'm going to lean towards Tesla, even though I know Bitcoin really weighs in heavy there. I think I'm going to stick with Tesla. Yeah, you know, I, I personally don't know the answer myself. We'll have to calculate it at the end. I didn't want to color my perception by doing I do know coming into this week, at least, uh, Bitcoin was at about a 93, 95 realized volatility. It had been moving quite a bit. So that was pretty elevated. Uh, but I don't know the exact levels off the top of my head. For these. That's kind of what made it fun. I want, And I don't want to give my vote. I'm not saying Bitcoin is my vote, listeners, because I don't want to color your voting. I'm just saying that, that gives that's one little frame of reference for you to sink your, your teeth into as you're doing your own analysis. Is that higher than Tesla? Is that lower than Tesla? Is that higher than a Q's or a NASDAQ? I'll leave that up to you. But I coming into this week, and again, it has moved this week as well, so that's changed. Come into this week, when we first quoted this, Bitcoin was at around 93, 95, 30-day realized vol. All that buying you some time. Uncle Mike, I believe you were on the Tesla tip before. Are you still on that tip, sir, or have you changed your mind? I was, but I'm actually switching over to, to oil or to, to WTI uh, just because the fact that we have XLE up 2% on the day, all these threats with Iran, um, I'm, gonna go, I'm moving over to oil. Well, you're not alone, Uncle Mike. In fact, our poll here still towards the latter half this week, and you got another day and change, listeners. It's a question of the week, so it inspires at the end of the week, the the trading week, not the end of the weekend. But yeah, it looks like so far our audience is about as split as you guys are. Oh, we did get we did finally get some votes for the cues. No one was loving the cues. Finally, today we're up to three percent for the cues. So there you go. A little bit of love for the cues. It was at zero, which was kind of odd. 
But uh, coming into today, they're still pretty, not quite evenly split, but still pretty close. Uh, 27% for WTI. That's moving up. Actually, it moved down a bit, which is interesting. I think it would move up given everything that's going on. Uh, 33% for Bitcoin and 37% for Tesla. So interesting stuff there. I can't wait to crunch the actual numbers officially. And don't worry, we'll go back to make sure it's the 30-day realized vol from when we posted this on Monday of last week. Even though you guys are voting throughout the week and your numbers will change, and we'll give you an updated one for next week too. But we'll see. Uh, I don't think it'll be that close where we'll need that difference. But we will calculate it all for you, give you the answer next week if you haven't played yet listeners at options is the place to go make your vote heard make your voice heard make your vote count it's it's we're not in chicago but we're based in chicago so vote early vote often we won't hold it uh, against you over there and we'll reveal the results in terms of the actual winners and what you guys picked next week let's keep on rolling we got some strategery questions i think you like sink your teeth in this one uncle mike and you probably as well colin this comes from Marival. Marival wants to know, what are your thoughts about selling strangled at strangles? Easy for me to say. Selling strangles <laughs> at the one standard deviation levels of a particular stock, sort of like a Bollinger Band strangle. What are your thoughts on this technique? Is it me or are there new techniques for selling strangles all the time that always tend to blow out? Aren't you better off selling iron condors or iron butterflies due to limited risk? Uh, let's, I'm going to start in the back half of that and then we'll work our way up. I think... Everyone on this show is going to advocate always for a more mitigated risk profile rather than just naked short units. How many times have you heard, you know, the former market makers like myself and Andrew and uh, and the Meatball and everybody else say, or you know, Matt and, or at some of our other shows or Dan, anybody, uh, come on and saying, hey, yeah, don't be net short units. That's the thing you have beaten into your head very early as a market maker because it can really come back to haunt you. At least spread it off so you're not risking blowing out. If something crazy and aberrant comes to pass and a strangle is, is, is all net short units. If you're selling a strangle, you're selling the upside and you're selling to the downside. So you have net short units in both directions. So you could easily see how something like that could not exactly work out well over the long. And in the near term, it could work out pretty well. It's one of those strategies that kind of works until it doesn't, right? And when it doesn't, you got to have a plan for that. And that's why an iron condor or I like, I'm more of an iron fly guy, but we talked about this before, whatever. In fact, an iron, iron butterfly is not really a strangle. It's, an, it's a straddle you're selling. So you got to be really, you got to really, got to really want it on that one. An iron condor is probably better for most people, and certainly this strategy, because that's actually selling a strangle and then buying another strangle against it. So that's more along the lines of what you're asking, Maribel. The iron butterfly is a, it's a little bit different beast. It's a little bit closer to the fire. I like to go that route, but it's not for everyone. I understand that. Uh, let's see. And are there new techniques for selling strangles all the time that always tend to blow out? Yes, there are many different ones. Sell a strangle here, sell a strangle there. It seems like people who do equity technical analysis suddenly one day wake up to options. And they say, oh, wait, <laughs> I like these levels. Let's sell options here. And that's kind of usually the starting point for a lot of this stuff. And maybe risk management isn't their forte, shall we say. But this, you know, I've seen this about bandied about before. It's not exactly new. The one standard, the Bollinger Band strangle. Uh, maybe, Colin, we'll start with you. You guys in Fidelity, all the hot seat guys, you, you like to be technical an analysis. And now, easy for me to say. Technical analyst <laughs> guys over there uh, in, in the Fidelity hot seat. What are your thoughts on this particular strategy, the Bollinger strangle, let's call it? And then, B, or I'm going to guess you you like to lean more of the risk mitigated way, but what is your preference, sir? Yeah, so you already hit right on the head. I mean, uh, to remember the Bollinger Band strangle, we're, we're talking about two standard deviations, right? And going out that far, how much premium are you really taking in? Now, obviously, that's going to vary between underline to underline. But when you squeeze those levels using a one standard deviation level, which is you know basically two-thirds or 68%, uh, is the range that we're looking at here. Obviously, you are bringing in a little bit more uh, premium there, but is it's less of an area for that price to dance. So you, I 100% agree with the sentiments that have already been stated, which is you need to have strong risk management techniques. And let's also be very candid. Can you stomach the risk, right? Unlimited risk to the upside, theoretically, and substantial risk to the downside, because there's, there's nothing defining the risk. So you, you definitely need to make sure that if you do do an approach like this, and you're going to continue to do it over and over again, I know a lot of probability traders like to repeat the process so they can allow the probabilities to play out. When you have a higher amount of winning trades, 
your real job is to really to manage the losing trade. That's really your job because you don't want that one losing trade to wipe out several occurrences of uh, these um, lower yielding trades. In essence, for discussing about, you know, um, strangles versus, you know, something like an iron condor, just that I know with selling an iron condor, you're taking in less premium, but you are defining your risk. So in essence, yeah, it, it tightens the range of where your break evens are. But the good part is, is that it defines your risk. Every trader is going to be different. Uh, I know uh, uh, Marco gives me a hard time about you know being very political with this, but really in essence, it's the preference of the trader. You know, are you can you even stomach having that uncapped risk? Uh, you know, every trader is different, and their appetite for risk really answers that question. Me, I'm a little bit more conservative, uh, so you already know where I'm going with that. Um, but in terms of which one is better than the other, there really isn't. It's it's more along the lines of can you manage your risk appropriately and, and how can you stomach the risk? That's what it comes down to me. Yeah, people think, oh, I'm giving up some of my return to buy that iron conduit, buy the other legs. And you are. But also, it's not a free lunch trade. Your broker is going to tie up a lot of capital to cover all these naked short positions you have. And so if you put on that that spread, you're going to actually maybe free up some capital that you wouldn't have had. So there's a bit of a trade off there as well. People always forget. They look at the net premium. Think that's the only cost to the trade. But there are other costs that are less obvious. And if you have all these naked short positions, uh, you're going to have all these other added costs in terms of tying up capital and margin that you otherwise maybe wouldn't have. So something to bear in mind if you're saying, oh, I don't want, I don't want to buy anything to hedge. Uh, Uncle Mike, sir, uh, what are your thoughts here on the on this Bollinger Band short strangle technique? It is very tough to manage leveraged risk to both sides. So what I mean by that is that let's say that um, you have a lot of money in your account and you're not using that much leverage and you have a lot of money in cash, uh, then, okay, that's a viable trade, uh, but sometimes the reward might not be there. Oftentimes when people do short strangles, they're leveraging themselves, meaning they're taking advantage of the, uh, the 20 percent that you have to have in your account uh, of the value of the underlying for the whatever the formula is, depending on what broker you're using. But usually it comes out to about 20 percent. So if a stock's trading at, say, uh, $30 a share and you're doing, let's say, the 27 half, 32 half short strangle, then you're likely going to have around six dollars per share. Um, as your maintenance requirement. When you're doing that, if you, depending on what level of leverage you use, <laughs> it becomes very tough. Because if the market moves just a little bit against you, and by against you, it means it moves, then you need to make an adjustment or you need to do something to adjust for that. And that's tough to watch. Uh, and it's very tough to do. Um, I think that, it, I think it's harder it, it, it has the illusion of being easier, but I really think from my experience, it's harder than trading levered futures contracts. If you're just being long or short a futures contract, you typically have your stop loss in place saying, okay, if it goes down to this level or up to this level, depending if you're long or short, that's when I get out. If it goes to this level for my profit, that's when I get out. It's very cut and dry. There's not a lot of management involved. But if you're doing a short strangle, you have to manage volatility. If volatility spikes, there might be more maintenance required. You have to manage time decay. At what point do you feel that enough time decay has come into place? Uh, what's your rule on that? Or what if one side is going way down and the other side or going your way and the other side just isn't moving because there's so much demand for the volatility. How do you manage that? At what point do you get out? Um, so there's a lot of moving parts with it. And it's the ultimate deceiver, in my opinion, in the whole option trading world of something that looks very easy, but really is very complex. You think about it, you're like, oh, so long as the stock doesn't move up to one standard deviation, I'm fine. I make money. What's the, why do I even have to bother thinking about this? Well, doesn't really work that way because let's say it moves to really close to one standard deviation out. You're thinking, oh, I'm still fine. But then the next day, it has another big move to go well beyond what you originally intended to be. You're leveraged on this and you're going to get burned on this. So I think, my opinion, I've done every option trade there is, or everyone that I've done quite a few of them anyway. But my opinion, the hardest one to manage, and this is why I haven't done one. And, well, over 10 years, 
is doing levered premium selling in a delta neutral setting. I think that is extremely hard to do, but it looks extremely easy, but it's really, really hard to do as a trader. You know, maybe we should up update, you know, there's the old maxims for warfare. You don't want to get engaged in a war on two fronts. Maybe we should have a maxim, particularly for beginning options traders. You don't want to, you don't want to be a short risk, short premium in two directions. What do you think? Is that, maybe that's, maybe that's a new, uh, a new starting maxim for options traders. What do you think, Uncle Mike? I, yes, because I think it, it's very hard to do as an advanced option trader. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. And speaking of Bollinger's, I, I can't not bring this up. It was one of my, one of my more disappointing moments early in my finance career. I was still in college. I had just transferred into finance from engineering. So I was kind of new to all these things, stocks and finance and money, all this fun stuff. And one of the assignments, I think it was like a markets or investing class, something along those lines. One of the assignments was to come up with a, you know, trading strategy. So me and a bunch of the guys sat down and we, you know, crunched numbers and all these things. We came up with this thing. We're like, oh, wait a minute. If the stock goes up one standard deviation, then you sell it. And then it drops down and goes down with Sandy, and then you buy it. Look at this is genius. How could this fail? So we were all super proud of ourselves. We marched into our professor's office, you know, whenever the prop the project was due. We handed it into him. He looks at it and goes, Oh, congratulations. You just discovered Bollinger Band. We're just like, what? <laughs> we're so we were so the air we thought we had cracked the code. We thought we had we had found the secret key uh, to the markets. And lo and behold, at the age of eighteen or nineteen or whatever, go figure we had not. Uh, but still, it was uh, it was an interesting and, and one of the more disappointing moments. Hopefully not for you. And hopefully, maybe if you're selling these strangles, maybe it could be disappointing. So bear our advice in mind as we keep on rolling around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. This is indeed the portion of the show where we tell you about what's on our radar for the rest of this week. Let's start the other way. Let's start in Fidelity land. Mr. Collins, sir, what is what is on your radar for the rest of this week into the weekend? Yeah, so take a look at uh, you know the IPO work that, that priced out today. See what, what's going to be happening with that. Is there going to be continuation with uh, the momentum that I had today? Is it going to follow beyond... Uh, example, or is it going to follow some of the previous ones with Lyft and Uber that they've been struggling? Um, also, I'm going to be focused on what's going on between the United States and Iran. Those tensions are, are seem to be heating up a little bit, uh, as well as kind of under the surface, maybe not as much coverage as what's going on with the United States and Turkey. Uh, very interested to see that. And then more short term outside of work, I'm also going to be taking a look at, uh, you know, what's going on with, uh, you know, the S&P being green, uh, bond buying going on, and the VIX being green. So it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to play out as well. So those are the things that I'm, I'm really monitoring. Yeah, work. I can't say that's a terrible ticker for Slack. Why isn't it, like, you know, SLK or SLCK, something like that, you know, uh, something along those lines. <laughs> work, I, I work makes me think of WeWork or something else along those lines, uh, obviously. But I've never really understood Slack. I mean, we have we use Google Docs here. We use Google productivity tools. If you have that, I don't see the need for Slack. But apparently I'm alone because a lot of people use it and a lot of people like it. So it seems like that functionality is offered by many other platforms. But for whatever reason, they may manage to put this together into a functional company that can go public. So, <laughs> ballyhoo, more power to them. Uncle Mike, sir, what is on your radar for the rest of the week? Watching Silver to see if this can continue to uh, go up. Uh, definitely not a stage to where I'm saying hi ho, Silver by any means. Uh, but definitely watching that. And uh, just everything that's already been said, I'm continuing to watch those things, seeing if we can break through the 3000 mark on the SPX. And um, by the way, you'll be happy to know, Mark, that I actually got an email from a client saying that he thinks box spreads are a wonderful way to close out exposure if you have the day trading situation. So oh. there's more talk on box spreads. Who knew box? We have to do a whole episode on box spread. These are clearly the sexiest thing in town right now. Who knew? Uh, so, yeah, box spreads, the little engine that could apparently. <laughs> when that question came in, I thought, oh, this is this is not going to be that. Or I th actually, it was, it was you guys. It was your Fidelity guys who brought it up. I thought, box spreads? Uh, who am I to judge? Clearly, that is that is the sexy area of the space right now. Unfortunately, that's all the sexy time we have for this episode, listeners. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let's start with our folks over there, our friends at the pit. They were on assignment today, but check them out, optionpit.com. You missed the big Chicago shindig. I was there. Uncle Mike was there. Steaks were had. It was delicious. But they have all kinds of cool, cool stuff going on. I keep teasing them, but maybe they'll have a, a something on box spreads coming. 
coming up because they're starting to feel the uh, the interest in boxes as well. So stay tuned maybe for that. Optionpit.com is the place to go. And Uncle Mike, sir, what is cooking in the land of St. Charles? Maybe they too want to write to you about box spreads. If so, how should they go about it? Hey, by all means, if you want go to my website, find my information, stcharleswealth.com, or feel free to give me a call, 630-885-0017. Uh, if you're looking for a financial advisor that uh, understands the box spread, but doesn't necessarily do it uh, all but maybe once every six or seven years, uh, I'm happy to talk box spreads with anybody. But uh, if you are looking for a financial advisor that's in the option space, I am your man. That might be hard to put on your business card. <laughs> the guy who understands box spreads but only does them once every six to seven years, Uncle Mike. <laughs> but hey, I would, yeah, I would, that's I, me. I would call that guy. <laughs> and on the back, you can say, do not get into leverage risk in, either, in both directions at the same time. That could be Uncle Mike's maximum number one. Uh, and then don't trade anything but Apple number two. And that's fine. Yes. You got a lot of things we could add there. So CharlesWealth.com is the place to go, listeners. And of course, if you want to learn about what's cooking in Fidelity Land, fidelity.com slash options is the place to go. If they go there, Colin, what can they expect? And what do you guys have uh, up your sleeve for the Fidelity clients these days, sir? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's funny that we bring up box spreads again. Uh, I think I jinxed us here because I actually just got a conversation about a short box spread yesterday. So <laughs> it's you guys. It is. You guys keep bringing it's it up. It's it's lighting up the tape apparently of fidelity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if they want to learn more or even uh, talk about short box spreads, uh, certainly they can always uh, check us out by either giving us a call at eight seven seven nine zero seven four four two nine. Uh, we're here to help you out. You can ask to speak with the trading strategist or even ask for me directly, Colin Stonger. Uh, here to help talk it through and make sure that what you're trying to accomplish is indeed what you're doing, as well as always take a look. We do online classes to help you out on various topics, ranging from option strategies to even uh, reading charts. So certainly take us a look. And once again, that's fidelity.com slash options. I like that. Making sure that what you're trying to accomplish is actually what you're doing. <laughs> that's Sometimes those things are mutually exclusive. So that, that's a good goal. Fidelity.com slash options is the place to go for all that goodness, listeners. Call him up. Ask for Colin. He'll be happy to talk to you. Or you can even ask for the last emperor train. Let ask for Colin first because he he's uh, he's loving your box spread questions. Send him more of those. <laughs> and on behalf of Colin and Uncle Mike and the pit crew and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in those great questions. Uh, stay tuned. Hopefully, maybe by tomorrow, Mixler will have their issues worked out. We can go back live for Volview. So fingers crossed for that. Otherwise, we'll see you back here next week for more of the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 